The National Desk, America's News, now. It will take substantially more evidence to give confidence that inflation is on a sustained downward path. Dialing back from recent hikes, the Fed's endgame as it slightly adjusts its aggressive campaign to fight inflation. And the fact check team looks into the prices that aren't budging. Then, overwhelmed border towns reaching a boiling point. 600 migrants sleeping in the streets. I mean, this is this is not what America should look like. Title 42, used to turn millions of migrants away during the pandemic, expires in just days. What the White House is asking for, amid warnings of an unimaginable migrant surge. Bankman Fried's entire house of cards started to crumble. The disgraced crypto king charged. As prosecutors accuse FTX founder Sam Bankman Fried of fraud, we're learning new details from a congressional hearing on the collapse of his cryptocurrency exchange. This is the National Desk, America's News Now. Thanks for being with us. I'm Didi Gatton. On this weekend edition, we take a look at the big headlines of the week and a look ahead at what to expect, starting with the four big stories we've been following this week. First, the Federal Reserve raising interest rates, pushing them to their highest level in 15 years. How the latest adjustments are impacting people and what it could mean for a possible recession. And Congress holds hearings investigating the fallout of failed crypto company FTX, how the former CEO may have used large donations to influence Washington. Then the battle over the southern border ramps up. The immigration policy sparking heated debates about how to keep a surge of migrants from coming to the U.S. Plus, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis asking his state Supreme Court to address any potential wrongdoing regarding the COVID-19 vaccine. Your money may not go as far if you're planning to take on a new loan. The Federal Reserve announcing the final interest rate hike of the year, bumping rates up half a percent. The hike following a better than expected consumer price index report that may signal inflation has peaked. The National Desk Entre El Nishar takes a closer look at the Fed's latest move. The Federal Reserve pushing ahead with more restrictive monetary policy to get control of the high inflation taking a toll on Americans, raising interest rates by 50 basis points. Fed Chair Jerome Powell justifying the necessary pain. Without price stability, the economy doesn't work for anyone. Inflation for consumer prices is improving, but the labor market remains extremely tight, driving wage inflation. Overall, the Fed has a long way to go on its way to its target 2% inflation rate. It will take substantially more evidence to give confidence that inflation is on a sustained downward path. Wednesday marks the end of the Fed's streak of four hikes of 75 basis points. A single hike that high hadn't been seen since 1994. Though Wednesday's hike is smaller, editor-in-chief of Investopedia Caleb Silver says it's still very significant. The Fed usually moves in increments of about a quarter percent and usually doesn't have to adjust monetary policy at all. Part of what makes their decision making so tricky is they're generally based on lagging indicators. What employment was last month, what prices were last month, and using that to steer the economy forward. Powell reiterating the full effects of their rate hikes are also lagging. But a few effects are instant. If you have any sort of a loan or if you're financing anything that has variable costs, those rates are likely to go up as well like credit card balances, something Silver says he's watching closely as rates rise. The average credit card balance per borrow is about $9,000. And if we get into a recession and we start to get a pullback on spending and we start to see more layoffs, that could become more of a concern. A scenario more likely with each rate hike and there's more to come in the new year. In Washington, I'm Atra Nishar for the National Desk, America's News Now. And right now, hospitals from coast to coast are filled to the max with COVID, RSV, and flu patients. Situations like that can result in scenes like this at UC San Diego Health. They had to use tents in parking lots just to create space. 
And they're not the only ones. Triage tents are becoming a common sight at hospitals across the country. With an overflow of patients, they say this is how they continue care. Last week, U.S. hospitals reached 80% capacity. That's the fullest they've been throughout the pandemic. Experts say we've improved a little this week, but COVID and flu infections are on the rise. New details on what prosecutors are calling one of the biggest financial frauds in history. The National Desk Kayla Gaskins has a look at how disgraced crypto king Sam Bankman Freed may have used FTX customer funds to influence Washington. And looking for charges piling up against FTX founder Sam Bankman Freed, including allegations he used customer money to funnel millions of dollars to Washington politicians through illegal donations. These contributions were disguised to look like they were coming from wealthy co conspirators, when in fact, the contributions were funded by Alameda Research with stolen customer money. U.S. Attorney Damian Williams saying both sides received money from Bankman Freed. All of this dirty money was used in service of Bankman Freed's desire to buy bipartisan influence and impact the direction of public policy in Washington. But Democrats receiving a much larger share, 40 million compared to 260,000 to Republicans, making Bankman Freed the second biggest Democratic donor behind billionaire activist George Soros. President Joe Biden benefiting from these donations. Press Secretary Karine Jean Pierre dodging questions on the topic. Anything that's connected to political contributions uh, from here, I, I, I would have to refer you to the DNC. His opinion, though. I, I just, is, just cannot speak to this uh, from here. Bankman Freed claims he gave an equal amount to both parties, but Republican donations were largely given as dark money. Sam Bankman Freed littered the place. Uh, with uh, both not just politicians, but the media as well uh, to uh, to get better coverage and uh, to get what he wanted out of the process. Back in March, a bipartisan group of lawmakers sent a letter to the chair of the SEC criticizing the agency's investigation into the crypto industry. Some of the signees benefited from Bankman Freed's money. Since the story broke, several lawmakers already have or are making plans to donate the amount of funds they received to various charities. And one of those is Beto O'Rourke, who's a former congressman. He returned $1 million of FTX connected campaign donations in light of the news about Bankman Freed and his illegal dealings. Well, Kayla, we're also learning that Sam Bankman Freed's parents are now being looked at as well. You know what that's about? Well, Eugene, first of all, it's important to note that there's no evidence that either of his parents knew about or were involved in the illegal activity that their son was conducting. But his dad, Mr. Bankman, was an employee of the company and he was also heavily promoting FTX as a brand in general. Also, his mom, Mrs. Freed, helped coordinate some of the political donations and she was previously head of a political action committee. So with the charges surrounding their son, now many want to know if his parents were just sideline cheerleaders or potentially more. Eugene. All right, we'll see how that unfolds. Kayla Gaskins reporting tonight from the Capitol. Thank you. A bill banning TikTok on government-issued devices is headed to the House after the Senate voted unanimously to pass it. In recent days, a growing number of governors passed similar bans at the state level. Meantime, Republican attorneys general from more than a dozen states are asking Apple and Google to stop labeling TikTok as teen-appropriate in their app stores. Montana's AG is leading the charge, saying TikTok's content is riddled with references to drugs, alcohol, sexual content, and eating disorders. There's been no comment from Apple, Google, or TikTok so far. Going beyond the podium, looking at what it will take to win the White House in 2024. The National Desk, Kayla Gaskins, explaining why rural America could play a role in the next election. Democrats increasingly struggling to connect with rural voters. The party winning just 34% of this demographic in 2022. That's down from the 42% of rural support captured in 2018. Democrats running for re-election in areas with mainly rural populations, expecting tough battles for 2024, like Senator John Tester from Montana. We got to focus our message more on the things we're doing for rural America. The infrastructure package is a prime example. Mm -hmm. It's going to help rural America big time when it comes to broadband and, and electrical distribution and, and roads and bridges. We 
didn't talk about it. We didn't talk about it from a rural perspective. Only 33 percent of rural voters supported President Biden in 2020, according to the Pew Research Center. But this year, not all Democrats striking out with the group. In 2022, Pennsylvania's Democratic governor-elect Josh Shapiro outperforming Biden by 15 points in rural communities. On the flip side, some, like Georgia Senator Raphael Warnock, performing worse than the president with rural voters. These candidates who were able to actually improve on Biden's margins with rural voters, um, those are the candidates who won. And so I think that it's it's just incredibly important to not write these voters off and to to look at the playbooks of the candidates that won. These candidates who really overperformed, they had really strong economic messages. Data also shows a key part of this Democratic base, young people shifting the way they vote. According to AP VoteCast, support for Democrats among voters under 30 dropping 8 percent compared with 2020 and 11 percent from the 2018 elections. Both of the major parties have been losed in members. It's those unaffiliated uh, that have really been gaining a lot of ground. While younger voters will continue to be targeted by Democrats, lost rural voters may be key to Democrats' ability to hold on to the Senate and the White House in 2024. In Washington, I'm Kayla Gaskins for the National Desk, America's News Now. Ron DeSantis has a big lead in a hypothetical 2024 Republican presidential primary. Look at your screen here. The USA Today Suffolk University poll showing the Florida governor leading former President Donald Trump by 23 points in a hypothetical general election rematch between Trump and President Biden. Biden leads 47 to 40 percent, but the poll shows DeSantis would beat Biden by four points. Yet another interest rate hike from the Federal Reserve. The fact check team breaking down how the increases are impacting record high inflation. Inflation slowed in November for the fifth month in a row, coming in at 7.1% year over year for the month. Now, you may notice some prices dropping, but others aren't budging at all. I'm back with the fact check team tonight. With slowing inflation now, Connor, uh, what are we still paying more for? Well, a really big one, especially ahead of the holidays, is grocery prices, which are up a per half a percent from October to November and 12% from a year ago. And if you plan to bake for the holidays, it might be a little pricier because, get this, flour is up almost 25% and milk almost 15% since last year. On top of that, coffee, fruits, and veggies are also up since last year. And we're still seeing things like car insurance, clothing, and housing costs, which includes rent, go up as well. Yeah, I know that's really forcing some people to have to prioritize their purchases, especially, as you mentioned, with the holidays now upon us. And now, Courtney, thankfully, some things are a little cheaper. That's right. Gas prices have dropped from their highest price of over $5 in June. Today, they're at a national average of around $3.20, according to AAA. And we pulled the latest data from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Take a look at your screen. In in November, the price of used cars, healthcare services, and airline fares are down compared to October. We also saw a price drop in energy and electricity, hotel rooms, furniture, and some meats like beef and pork. Okay, just in time for those holiday food feasts with the family. Thank you both. Uh, now, for more on this fact check team topic and also links to their sources, you can visit us online at thenationaldesk.com or scan that QR code on your screen. On a mission to help struggling families this holiday season, the project she took on in honor of her late son that will bring cheer to countless others. And a unique attraction drawing more than just tourists, how this 50-foot leg lamp replica has an entire town dreaming big.
The National Desk team of reporters bringing you the headlines from coast to coast. We're taking the pulse of America, starting in Rhode Island, where a woman is keeping her son's memory alive with a toy drive in his honor. Signs posted outside of Patricia Marzini's Warwick home read, Big Guy Toy Drive. He was larger than life. He was the life of the party. And inside are her proud printed pictures of her only son, 28-year-old Alex Abjornson. And he just loved Christmas. And his birthday's three days after Christmas. Unfortunately, this year, there will be no celebration. Alex passed away in August from an unexpected heart attack. It was the worst day of my life. I honestly didn't know how I was going to get over it. Every day is a struggle because he was my life. To help cope around Christmas, Trisha had an idea. So we have collected a lot of stuff. This is one of my favorite. Since she knows how much it means to have a helping hand during the holidays, she started a toy drive in his honor. I was a single mom. I had him at 19, and so I would always depend on toys for tots and stuff like that for his Christmases. For the last month, she's been collecting more than 500 toys. There was hundreds of people at his wake, and I said if a quarter of, a peop of the people at his wake could buy one gift, all the children we could help. So that's exactly what we did. Half of them were delivered to the Free Little Pantry in Warwick, and the other half are going to Hyannis, where Alex worked. His friends just took it and ran. Trisha hopes this will help make holidays happy for others. She says hosting the toy drive and being surrounded by people who loved her son has been a great gift. You can only imagine how many people she'll be helping. Now over to Utah, where the Sandy City Police arrested seven people in porch thefts. Officials say they launched an investigation after the thieves were caught on doorbell cameras on multiple occasions in a short span of time. Some victims sharing those videos online, one of them saying the thefts are both shocking and frustrating. This one this morning, I was like, oh my God, like, are you serious? I hope the protein shakes were worth it because <laughs> they all got busted for it. The Sandy City Police Department now looking into whether the suspects work together in an organized effort. In Oklahoma, a 50-foot version of the iconic leg lamp from the movie A Christmas Story is bringing tourists and even investors to the town of Chickasha. The city was putting the finishing touches on the $1.4 million lamp when investor Chad Hitt came to town, liked what he saw, and said he wanted to invest $5.5 million to bringing new businesses to the area around this lamp. The lamp also attracting new visitors to the area. It's pretty amazing. Like you grow up watching the Christmas story and we're coming over the bridge and I'm like, oh my God, there it is. And I'm like, get your camera out, take a picture. Yes, why not? The city says local businesses and residents came together to come up with the funds to build this iconic lamp. Rising costs ahead on the national desk. Why you'll be paying more for utilities plus what families are cutting back on to make ends meet.
don't toss out your mask just yet. The CDC is again recommending wearing masks indoors as the triple demic of COVID, the flu and RSV overwhelms emergency rooms. The CDC's COVID community level map shows people in more than 9% of counties across the U.S. are at a high risk of infection. About $6 billion in earmarks or direct spending on what some call pet projects of lawmakers found their way into the omnibus spending bill to fund Congress. The National Des Eugene Ramirez sat down with Andy Adam Andrewski of government spending watchdog group OpenTheBooks.com to dig into what those earmarks mean. Well, Eugene, bringing back earmarks is the equivalent of bringing back the swine flu. Earmarks are the currency of corruption in Congress, and the last time that they were banned, 10 years ago, there was about 9,000 earmarks per year, and that people just thought that that was outrageous. These member pet projects doled out to put together votes on big spending bills, these omnibus spending bills. But today, there's already 7,500 earmarks uh, tucked back in after the Republicans in the House took a secret vote where 158 Republicans voted to bring back this egregious practice of earmarking these pet projects. And so look, you had Republicans in the last election back home in the district talking as fiscal conservatives and as outsiders to Washington, D.C., and the first thing they do is take a secret vote <laughs> to, you know, not to show people how they are going to spend your money. And then all of a sudden there's 7,500 earmarks for $16 billion. And, and let's take a look at some of those specific projects. I know some of them are, are very specific. Uh, road construction projects, I saw several of them. Uh, but there's also some vague line items in there. I saw the word facilities over and over again with not a whole lot of detail. As you dig through this list, what's really sticking out for you? So we did some keyword searches on the Republican House, on the House's earmarks. And, you know, the YMCAs are going to be big winners. There's $52 million being earmarked by members of Congress for YMCAs across the country for, for their uh, projects and for their building construction plans. Um, you've got a lot of local projects that should be funded locally, hmm. and they can't make the argument that they need federal dollars to fund these local projects. Let, let's For look example, at some of the top spenders. Uh, let's look at some of the top spenders here, because I want to be able to get this in. Seven of them are Republicans, seven, uh, seven of the top ten. Uh, meantime, Republicans have been pushing for a short-term spending package because they're hoping to take up this year-long funding when they run the House uh, in January. So what gives here? Are they hedging their bets with these earmarks and, and trying to kind of win uh, one way or the other? Well, the Democrats are no, no dummies. They want their bill with their spending priorities. They don't want to have to deal with the Republican House come January. So they're doing the legal bribe of, of doling out hundreds of millions of dollars worth of earmarks to Republicans. Seven out of the top 10 in the Senate are Republicans on this bill. Yeah, Richard uh, Shelby, one of them from Alabama, a Republican as well, has the most earmarks, more than $650 million worth. He's retiring this term, and it's important to note here that others in that same position, including Democrats, uh, are putting in their big requests as well. Uh, what message does this send? Is this like a, a goodbye gift to their constituents? Well, I think what it, it set, the sends the message to everybody is that you can't trust Republicans on their messaging. And it's why we there was no red wave in the last election. The voters just don't uh, trust Republicans to hold the line on spending and defend their pocketbooks. Yeah, we often hear a lot of talk about, uh, you know, who's spending uh, more than others. But uh, when it comes down to it, everybody's putting in their big requests. Hannah Mangieski, thanks for sharing your thoughts with us tonight. Thank you. Coming up here on the National Dad's Delivery Deadline, the day you need to circle on your calendar to get gifts to loved ones ahead of the holidays. Taking a look at the top trending stories on our website right now, a Florida police officer is recovering from a fentanyl overdose during a traffic stop near Orlando. Look at this video. Fellow officer saving her life using three doses of Narcan to revive her. 
And Stephen, Twitch boss, the beloved dancer and longtime DJ for the Ellen DeGeneres show, has died. According to the Los Angeles County Medical Examiner, his death was by suicide. Twitch was 40 years old. And reality TV stars Todd and Julie Crisley have been ordered to serve their prison time in two separate Florida prisons next month. The Crisley Knows Best couple found guilty last month of conspiracy to defraud banks and several tax crimes. Those stories and much more available right now at thenationaldesk.com. Looking ahead to stories making headlines this week, the House Committee investigating the January 6th Capitol attack will hold its final public meeting on Monday. Its full report set to be released on Wednesday. Border policy Title 42 used to turn millions of migrants away during the pandemic over health concerns is set to expire on Wednesday. We'll have more details about the fallout straight ahead. And the deadline to send Christmas presents through USPS is right around the corner. Monday, the final day to send gifts via its priority mail service. Friday is the cutoff for express service. More of your money will be going to foot the bill for utilities. Big storms have hit utility systems hard the past few years. Gas and electric companies have been turning to bonds to pay for costs like the investments needed to fix their infrastructure. Now customers are on the hook for repaying those loans. According to the Census Bureau, one third of U.S. households have cut down on food and medicine just to cover those energy bills. Coming up on the National Desk, a vaccine investigation. What the governor of Florida wants the state Supreme Court to look into and why. You're watching the National Desk, America's News Now. You can catch us live weekdays from 6 a.m. to 11 a.m. and 10 p.m. to midnight Eastern Time. And of course, anytime online at thenationaldesk.com. We'll be right back. The National Desk, America's News, now. The investigation will further prove that what we've been saying all along about Secretary Mayorkas. Every day Secretary Mayorkas remains in office, America becomes less safe. 20 Republicans are demanding an impeachment inquiry of Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas in the next Congress, saying Mayorkas has not done enough to secure the southern border. Mayorkas has said he does not intend to resign and has called for a proposal to fix what he calls a broken immigration system. This is the National Desk, America's News Now. Thanks for being here. I'm Didi Gatton. Officials near the border call the situation unsustainable as they grapple with thousands of migrants coming to the U.S. hoping to claim asylum. What officials call a surge could be a preview of what's to come when Title 42 is lifted this week. Here's the National Desk, Christine Frizzau. Along the southern border, overwhelmed has become an understatement for those in charge. Just over the weekend, more than 2,400 migrants crossed into the United States near El Paso. The border chief there tweeting out these photos of the situation on the ground. As has been the case in other cities, local shelters there overwhelmed. It essentially shows that the city is at a breaking point. 600 migrants sleeping in the streets. I mean, this is this is not what America should look like. In Arizona, the governor has ordered thousands of shipping containers to be used to create a makeshift wall. You can put all the wall and all the resources down, but as long as you have an administration, this administration, who have policies that are encouraging, incentivizing, and facilitating illegal immigration, it's not going to stop. The former Border Patrol head and many Republicans in Congress blame the Biden administration for ending policies they say worked. When he stopped the uh, uh, Remain in Mexico policy, when he stopped the border wall construction, when he 
reinstated the catch and release program. All this happening a week before Title 42 is set to end, which had allowed border agents to turn back about half of migrants in the name of public health. With concerns mounting, things will get much, much worse, with migrants coming not just from Central and South America, but the New York Times reports the decimated economy in Cuba has led to 2% of the entire population leaving the country, most arriving by land. A lot of it occurs because of where the violence is and what the uh, situation is from the countries that they, they're leaving from. Wherever there is upset in the world and the general region, uh, people flee from it. And the White House has now asked Congress for an additional $3 billion to try to help for once Title 42 expires next week. Although I should say there are a few details about just what resources will be sent to the southern border to assist. I'm Christine Frizzau reporting for the National Desk, America's News Now. Christine, thank you. The Biden administration's latest attempt to end the Remain in Mexico program, which makes migrants wait in Mexico for their U.S. immigration proceedings, was blocked by a federal judge in Texas for a second time this week. The Supreme Court ruled this summer that the White House has the authority to end the program, but justices sent the case back to the lower court's judge to consider if the proper procedures were followed in announcing the end of the program. Some border agents have major concerns. The end of Title 42 will bring even more migrants to ports of entry and turn into a catastrophe. Former Acting Commissioner of Customs and Border Protection and visiting fellow with the Federation for American Immigration Reform, Mark Morgan, talked with our Jan Jeffcoat about what he says will happen next at the southern border. I got an up close and personal look, boots on the ground, thanks to incredible work being done by the men and women of Texas DPS, their elite aircraft division and their criminal investigative division. And what I saw is what we've been talking about for the past two years, an unmitigated intentional catastrophe at our southwest border. And I think that's very important to mention. Look, we're already in the throes of the worst border crisis that we've seen in our lifetime. And keep in mind, this administration has had Title 42 the entire time during the past two years as we're already in the middle of the crisis. So look, when Title 42 ends, it's just going to make, it's hard to imagine, but it's going to take the crisis and simply make it worse. Look, to, to piggyback on a couple of stats, Jan, in the first 11 days of this month in December, uh, El Paso sector has seen over 23,000 apprehensions and over 10,000 gotaways. They're only one of nine sectors along the southwest border. So far in the first 70 days, they've seen over 100,000 apprehensions and more than 60,000 gotaways. With or without Title 42, because this administration has dismantled every effective tool that we had in place, we're already in the middle of a crisis. Well, the Biden administration did announce it's going to appeal the court ruling that dismissed Title 42, contradicting their previous support of lifting the policy. Can we talk a little bit about the hypocrisy here first? They know what's been happening at the border. So why now is the administration pushing to keep the policy in place? Yeah, look, I think it's obvious. I think they see the same thing that we all see is that, look, they're going to take this intentional crisis that they've created and make it worse. And, and, and Jan, let's talk about the hypocrisy for a minute. I, I can't keep up with it. There's too much of it. But look, it wasn't that long ago. Let me just hit a couple of them. There, it wasn't that long ago where the president of the United States says the pandemic was over. Remember, Title 42 is not a border security tool. It's a public health tool to prevent COVID from being introduced in this country, killing more Americans. But the president said the pandemic is over. But now you have a, a major uh, cities like New York saying, no, 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 it's not over. In fact, you know, infectious diseases like RVS and the flu and the COVID is back on the rise. And so now uh, mandatory mask requirements are going out throughout major metropolitan cities. Yet our border is still wide open. And let's not forget, even with Title 42, their own, this administration is only applying it to about a third of those that are illegally entering the, the, uh, the, the, the borders. So it makes no sense and it's filled with hypocrisy from A to Z. Arizona Governor Doug Ducey built a three mile long barrier of shipping containers along the southern border in this desperate attempt to try and slow the surge of illegal border crossings. Governor Ducey says it's gonna span 10 miles when it's done and contain more than 3,000 containers. Mark, how effective are these barrier methods? Look, it's very effective in the sense, and look, Jan, you and I have talked about it. I appreciate you bringing this up. 
the, the, there's been a tried and true strategy that the Border Patrol has implemented, and they've been applying this for a very long time. And it's very effective. And the multi-layer strategy is infrastructure, technology, and personnel. Whenever you have those three layers in the right strategic locations, the right amount, you'll see every single measure of success improve. And that's what we've seen over the lifespan of, of border security. But keep in mind that resources in this situation, it's not enough. You can put all the wall and all the resources down, but as long as you have an administration, this administration, who have policies that are encouraging, incentivizing, and facilitating illegal immigration, it's not going to stop. And when you have an increase of illegal immigration, our ability to secure the border goes down, no matter the amount of resources, technology, and infrastructure you have. So I applaud his efforts, but it's not enough. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis says he will ask for a state grand jury investigation into the impact of COVID-19 vaccines. The National Dance Luli Ortiz has the story. Governor Ron DeSantis and State Surgeon General Dr. Joseph Latipo held a roundtable discussion to announce some new initiatives related to COVID mandates and the health of Floridians. Governor Ron DeSantis has just announced a series of executive actions, which he hopes will protect Floridians from federal government outreach and dig deeper into possible misconduct or harm done in the name of protecting people from the pandemic without proper research or precautions. First on the list, forming a public health integrity committee. This group, under the state surgeon general, will assess any future federal health mandates to ensure that they have the best interests and outcomes for people living in our state. It's time to start taking stock of what went wrong and make reforms so this doesn't happen again. More controversial are the governor's call for an investigation into deaths that may have been caused by the COVID vaccine. Today, uh, I'm announcing a, a petition with the Supreme Court of Florida to impanel a statewide grand jury. And his request for a statewide grand jury to investigate possible criminal wrongdoing related to the rollout and administration of the vaccine and related mandates. My initial reaction was shock. Dr. Mark Pamer, who practices in Port St. Lucie, is a strong advocate for the vaccine. He says the CDC has acknowledged the risks of myocarditis and other adverse side effects, but says incidents are vanishingly rare. That the vaccines at this point are the most studied drug vaccine in the history of the world. They have been studied in hundreds of thousands of people in randomized trials. They've been studied in millions of people in overall meta-analysis and been shown over and over to be safe. If the Florida Supreme Court approves the governor's request to impanel a grand jury, which it likely will, it's expected to ask for detailed records of patient outcomes, trials, and other information from vaccine makers and the federal government. In West Palm Beach, I'm Luli Ortiz. Los Angeles has declared a state of emergency over homelessness in the city. It's the first action taken by the city's new mayor, Karen Bass. Bass saying the declaration recognizes the issue as a crisis and allows the city to take a faster approach to relocating people from the streets indoors. The mayor says more than 40,000 people in L.A. are homeless. Setting environmental standards. The fact check team looking at whether strict European measures could make it here. In an effort to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, France is making history as the first country to ban some domestic flights if there is an existing train alternative. Our fact check team has been looking into the details for us tonight. Janae, give us just the facts here. How is this going to work? So, Eugene, folks in France won't be able to hop on a plane for some of their shorter trips. The ban says if you can get to your destination in less than two and a half hours by train and one is available, you will no longer have the option to fly. Now, this will be in effect for three years and reviewed after two. Well, now, train travel is pretty uh, common and convenient as well in Europe, but I'm sure some people are going to miss that flight option. When is this going to kick off? So no exact start date just yet, although they want to get this moving quickly. The measure first has to go through several regulatory steps. Okay, this approach could spread throughout Europe. Connor, do we have any idea of which countries are looking to follow France on this? We know of one that's at least a little bit interested. The UK's Green Party leader is calling to adopt France's standards, and I thought this was interesting. It's not as far as France's ban, but Belgium is imposing new taxes on private jets and short-haul flights to help cut down on air pollution. Now, America 
Americans like their right to choose what they want to do. So do you think something like that is going to come here? It's hard to tell. It doesn't seem likely, but we haven't heard or seen any official plans just yet. But we do know the Biden administration is working to have net zero emissions by 2050. And we found that right now, the U.S. doesn't have the same high-speed rail infrastructure as other countries. The White House even notes that China has 22,000 miles of high-speed rail and is planning to double that by 2035. The U.S. has less than 50 miles. The bipartisan infrastructure law is looking to get the U.S. up to speed by dedicating $66 billion to Amtrak maintenance and railroad expansion. And California is setting aside $4.2 billion for their high-speed rail project. But Eugene, we're just going to have to wait to see if there's going to be any policy changes. Yeah, definitely not the same here in the U.S. as it is in Europe. Uh, ladies, thanks for your work on this. For those of you watching at home, take a deeper dive into France's approach to these environmental concerns. You can also find the links to the fact check team sources for this investigation by following that QR code you see there on your screen or visit us at thenationaldesk.com. Volunteers needed the challenge in finding firefighters and how smaller cities are trying to lure new recruits. This is the National Desk, America's News Now. Our team of nearly 4,000 local journalists bringing you the headlines from coast to coast. We're taking the pulse of America, starting with a doctor who says she was forced to pay a Los Angeles parking ticket she didn't deserve. Dr. Caitlin Benchel couldn't believe what she received in the mail, a $93 ticket for parking in the red zone in Los Angeles. We called and said, um, we were not in LA on this date, we were both at work, you have the wrong color vehicle. And they said, oh, no problem. We thought it would be dropped and it would be no problem. A month later, LA Parking Enforcement wrote to say the request to dismiss the ticket was denied. I have proof that I was at the office seeing patients all day in Lemoore, so nowhere near Los Angeles, and my husband um, also had proof that he was at his job seeing patients. The next letter, she says, was very threatening. They were going to uh, not let me register my truck with the DMV and that um, the fines would go up if I didn't pay it. Dr. Batchel sent one last letter. Parking enforcement's reply, paid in a week, or the fine doubles. Dr. Bencho surrendered and paid the $93 ticket. I think it brings the city money. I think they don't care, and I think that they don't want to be bothered. So they make it such a pain to deal with it that they people just eventually pay it. If you walk down 12th Street in Capitol Hill, this is what you'll have to walk past. A homeless encampment and trash piled up along the sidewalk, including couches and a mattress. This problem has gotten worse in recent weeks. People in the area said they're concerned about the camp, but also about retaliation if they spoke out publicly. We're all facing kind of the same challenges to a recovering economy. The Capitol Hill Business Alliance says this concern is something their organization hears often. Is there trash that has to get picked up and moved away? Do people have access to appropriate bathing facilities? Capitol Hill is experiencing an economic comeback after turbulent years with the protests of 2020, which took over the area and the pandemic, which impacted businesses who rely on residents and visitors. Some here are hoping the city can find a quick solution for the people staying in this homeless camp and for the neighborhood. Are we combating some of the same difficulties that other neighborhoods are? Absolutely. Um, but that shouldn't be a deterrent. 
firefighters are aging, the, the demographic of them, you know, and it's getting harder to recruit new members. The lack of volunteers isn't necessarily pushing fire departments to the point of shutdown. It wasn't uncommon for someone to, to volunteer for five, seven, ten years at a time. Um, and now most of those volunteers um, that we get are staying three to five years. Some are hoping incentives could help retain recruits. We're willing to invest in you and we want you to help us. In the end, there is a little bit of reward. The Iowa Firefighters Association is proposing retirement incentives where the state would match whatever amount the city was willing to put down. So you would want to stay for around for at least 10 years. The Nevada Fire Department credits their staffing successes largely to community outreach, whether that's through social media or in person. We want people to have a positive interaction with our fire department and I think that's where it's different for us is that we are a, the face of the community. We are the central part of our town. And still to come, our team of correspondents breaking down this week in Washington from the Federal Reserve's final rate hike of the year to senators passing a ban on TikTok. Our Washington Bureau covers the nation's capital every day to report on the important issues facing the country and how they impact you. For some perspective, I'm joined by national correspondent Atra Elnishar. Atra, big economic news this past week, a lot of it actually. The Fed raising interest rates in line with what Wall Street was expecting, yet the markets tanked in the wake of the Fed's announcement. Why? Right, by 50 basis points, which is less aggressive than the last four 75 basis point rate hikes, uh, but still uh, very, very significant. Uh, and the reason uh, stocks tanked, even though it was what they were expecting, what investors were expecting, is because when Fed Chair Jerome Powell came out and did his press conference, he made it loud and clear that even though they have rolled out a less aggressive rate hike, they are nowhere close in there in the Fed's eyes to getting uh, inflation on a downward path, a, a reliable downward path toward their 2% target as they pr face persistent headwinds like an extremely tight labor market, which of course is adding to wage inflation. Now, as the Fed does when they roll out an interest rate hike, they also update their summary of economic projections. And what that suggested to us, Steve, is that in 2023, the Fed's expecting they'll roll out another 75 basis points worth of rate hikes. Now, Powell said the big question going forward is not how much they do at once, but how long they keep rates high until they do, in fact, see that inflation is on a consistent trajectory downward closer to that 2%. Right now, it's depending on what uh, index you're looking at, it's between the neighborhood of six and a half to seven. Yeah, and we also saw retail sales slumping last month and polls show Americans more and more pessimistic about the economy. We'll be watching that very, very closely as we go into 2023. Another story you're following, Atra, the move to ban in the U.S., the world's most popular app. Why is TikTok on the clock? Right, yeah, tough news for Gen Zers who, who love their TikTok. It, it, it's, uh, at least according to one FCC commissioner, not a matter of if TikTok is banned in the United States, but when. So this week we saw the Senate uh, on a broad, unanimous, unanimous bipartisan basis, it passed with unanimous consent, pass a bill that would ban TikTok on all federal government devices. Uh, it follows in the footsteps of some states. Uh, this has mostly been a Republican-led effort to uh, ban TikTok on uh, government devices. Devices. On a state level, we recently saw uh, Maryland and Texas, just to name a couple, do this as well. Uh, but really, the threat is that TikTok or its parent company, ByteDance, which is based in Beijing, is collecting user data. Uh, and because of the, how the laws are in, in communist China, if a company is requested by the state to collaborate, uh, they're required to do that. Very different than what the U.S.'s democratic values and laws would be should, you know, if the government wanted to subpoena something, for instance. So the fear is that this is a national security threat uh, as China tries to become the world's biggest economic superpower. So as far as whether it passes in the House in this Congress, that looks to be a, kind of a tall order given uh, the limited number of days and other things this Congress has to get done, like government funding. Uh, but we're certainly seeing momentum build uh, across both parties, uh, from, from local governments to the federal government, 
to get TikTok at least off of government devices. And if this ban does happen, a lot of unanswered questions such as how do they actually ban it off of people's phones? Right. And what is the reaction of, of the 100 plus million plus users in the United States uh, who use this? We haven't heard from them yet. Uh, if this is gone, it'll be interesting to see what happens there. National correspondent Atra Elnishar, thank you. Didi, thank back to you. Steve, Vacha, very interesting information there. Thank you. The Supreme Court said to take on a second case involving student loan debt forgiveness. Coming up, the claims this legal challenge makes of the controversial program. Developing now, the fate of President Biden's student loan forgiveness plan is in the hands of the U.S. Supreme Court. The National Desk, Kayla Gaskins, has more on this second legal challenge set to come before the justices next year. The Supreme Court agreeing this week to hear a second challenge to President Biden's student loan forgiveness plan. This case is brought by two individual borrowers, Myra Brown and Alexander Taylor, who don't qualify for full debt relief. The conservative advocacy group Job Creators Network Foundation is backing the lawsuit. We're very pleased that the Supreme Court finds the case important enough um, to hear. Earlier this month, the court agreed to hear another case brought by a group of six Republican-led states. Republican members of Congress and Republican governors are doing everything they can to deny this relief, even in their, to their own constituents. Legal challenges began as soon as Biden announced his plan this past August, forgiving up to $20,000 of debt for borrowers making under $125,000 a year. I want to be clear who's going to benefit most, working people, middle class folks. The Congressional Budget Office estimates the forgiveness will cost half a trillion dollars. Critics pointing out only Congress has the power for such spending, not the executive branch. We're pushing back on this program and we filed this litigation because it's a complete uh, government overreach. Again, this president does not have the authority and does not have endless authority um, to uh, rule as a king, essentially. 26 million applications have been filed. 16 million applications are already approved, but on hold pending the Supreme Court's decisions. Meanwhile, Biden extending a pandemic era pause on payments through next summer while the legal cases play out. The oral arguments for the case will be heard in either February or March. A decision is expected next summer. In Washington, I'm Kayla Gaskins. Well, that'll be all for us on the weekend edition of The National Desk, America's News Now. Don't forget, you can catch us live from 6 a.m. to 9 a.m. and 10 p.m. to midnight Eastern Time. Check your local listings. And you can also watch us online and catch up with the latest headlines on thenationaldesk.com. Thanks for watching. Have a great weekend.